I'm Ed Jaffe and welcome back to the Woodwind Legacy Series. Today we're going to be talking uh, and sharing uh, information uh, with one of the great woodwind players, a supreme clarinetist and saxophonist who's been on the scene for well over 30 years, has over 30 recordings, to, solo recordings to his name, and has been one of the most influential people in bringing back the clarinet to the jazz world uh, in a sense that now we, we see it as an instrument that so many young players are gravitating to and finding enjoyment from, not only in the classical world, but certainly in the jazz field. And I want to thank Ken Poplowski for joining us hey. today. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, my pleasure. Thanks for coming out thank on you. Easter Sunday and doing this. My uh, pleasure. Uh, so let's get right to it and, and talk about your uh, upbringings. Uh, you grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, as I understand, and uh, certainly your family, a musical family that you were uh, born into. Uh, tell us a little bit about those early years and how you came to uh, gravitate towards clarinet and saxophone. Okay, well, I grew up in a Garfield Heights, uh, southeast of, of Cleveland, a suburb. And my father was a cop, a uh, Cleveland patrolman, and uh, an amateur musician. So he loved, to, he loved music. Uh, my family disagreed on just about everything but music. <laughs> we had a shared passion for music. Uh, there's a lot of strife in the family, a lot of, you know, hard times, uh, you know, discipline stuff, you know, but, but music brought everybody together. Uh, and it was, you know, that age, it, I was born in 1959. I think families then listened to music across the board. Whatever came out, we would listen to together. Right. We enjoyed the Beatles. We enjoyed Duke Ellington. We enjoyed Benny Goodman. We enjoyed Frank Sinatra, classical music. And it was also available on, on radio and TV uh, in prime time. That's right. The Ed Sullivan Show, for one example, sure. you'd see everything under the sun in 90 minutes, you know. Sure. So uh, so we all shared that together. It wasn't. It, I think it's ironic now with... Uh, the internet making everything available to everybody all the time for nothing. Uh, a lot of younger people are actually more closed-minded than I think we were back then. We, hmm. we would, I'd talk to my friends about Frank Zappa and then talk to them about a Benny Goodman record and you'd, you'd share all these different crazy right. things. Sure. But, so my father tried to play different musical instruments and gave each one of them up in frustration. <laughs> so my brother wound up with the trumpet. Uh, he then tried to play the clarinet, gave that up. I wound up with the clarinet. And I joke about this, but it is true. Had I been the third child, which there wasn't, I'd be an accordion player. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was his next instrument. Well, and the polka bands. Hey, that's what we did, yeah. too. My brother and I had an amateur polka band. Uh, a, a, like a kid's novelty group. When I was about 11 years old, he was 13, and we were playing weddings and dances uh, and working. Um, the I remember the first job was, uh, we played at the local library. Uh, we played f for, for people to listen and dance. And uh, we were called the Harmony Kings. But, <laughs> but it was all my father's kind of frustration with not being a good musician funneled into us. And me having an older brother who who spurred me on to try to be as good as he was, which he, he was really good. Um, and in Polish polkas, the clarinet improvises. It's very similar to New Orleans jazz. It's You've got two trumpets playing in tandem. You've got songs that have three or four parts to them. And the clarinet's doing all, all this arpeggio-based improvising. Obligato stuff. Right? Yeah. 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 So it's... It's like learning how to swim by being thrown into the water. You know, I, right. I wasn't told that I couldn't do it, so I did it. I was, I was improvising on these, this music. We were also, because we were playing weddings and dances, we would have to learn old standards. Uh, we'd have to learn how to fake songs. We played top 40 things. And at the same time, uh, I, about two years into that, I picked up the saxophone out of necessity to play certain kinds of songs. And the more I played these instruments, the more I started listening to uh, all these musicians like Benny Goodman and uh, actually Robert Marsalis with the Cleveland Orchestra, that beautiful sound. Of course. Uh, Jimmy Hamilton with Duke's band was a major influence on me. 
Yeah. Uh, but buying records with the money I spent, the money I earned, you know, doing these weddings and dances, I buy lots of records. My first record purchase I still remember was Stan Getz More West Coast Jazz. Wow. Um, and, uh, but it's a funny thing uh, to give you a short, you know, insight into seeing, seeing the Beatles in the movie theater in 1964, I was five years old, seeing, seeing a hard day's night. Right. Made me want to play music for a living, even then. Uh, listening to... Was it the girls chasing the Beatles? Well, that's a part of it. <laughs> Little did I know my kind of music, forget it. <laughs> it goes the other way around. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no, but it's... And also that, that magnetism they had. But then, yeah. but then with the instruments I played, you know, listening to all these people, Jimmy Hamilton and, and uh, Benny and then Sonny Stitt and, you know, Stan Getz, Zoot Sims, and Charlie Parker, and that made me gravitate towards jazz. Uh, so it's kind of a weird set of influences there. Well, those are a lot of great influences, and 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 uh, you know, still they are great influences and great heroes. But uh, did you have any formal training with uh, you know specific teachers of clarinet or, and or saxophone at, during those early years? Yeah, I took. Um, formal lessons all the way through the two years I went to college. And the best teacher was this guy named Albert Blazer, uh, who played in the Cleveland Ballet Orchestra. Uh, and he was a really tough clarinet teacher. Because um, if I say so myself, I mean, when I was a kid, I was like a little kind of a child star and I could, I could always sight read anything. So I would play all the time at home uh, play songs, practice jazz. I never took jazz lessons in my life, uh, huh. except a couple lessons with Sonny Stitt uh, on the road. But I never studied jazz except learning by listening. And, you know, I might read some books, you know. Right. But it was all classical clarinet studies. Interesting. Um, and so I could always sight read my lessons. And I'd go in and breeze through the, my lessons until I got this teacher in, it started in junior high school, and he, I think, you know, he saw something in me and was extra hard on me, actually, which I needed, and made me th rethink everything about uh, how I produce sound, and because I was doing a lot of shortcuts, you know, so about breathing properly, putting the air through the horn the right, right. way, um, got me to actually take a couple years of voice lessons in college. Uh, classical voice lessons, which helped me with my breathing, you know. Well, you know, uh, there's, there are documented stories of, of great woodwind players taking voice lessons for a period of time like that. Uh, I know Jimmy Galway did when he was uh, working in the opera orchestra, I think it was Sadler Wells. And, uh, and then recently I discovered that Tony Giliotti, uh, early in his tenure with the Philly Orchestra, uh, went to take voice lessons because Ormandy felt that he wasn't playing loud enough. Mm. And so Giotti figured, well, let me see if I can improve my resonance by studying voice, which was a very smart thing to do. And uh, as we know, certainly the, the carryover and learning to breathe properly for a wind instrumentalist is, is everything. It is everything. It really is, uh, which I learned because, uh, you know, we could talk about this more in depth at a, a different point if you, you'd like, but uh, for me, I, learning that early on made me step away from the obsession people have with equipment and changing mouthpieces all the time and reads. And I just tried to think a lot about what I wanted my sound to be like by listening to people that I liked and thinking, well, I like a little bit of this, this, I like this and this person. Right. Um, were there singers who, who you Oh my God, Frank Sinatra, first and foremost, was and still is to me the perfect example of absolutely great phrasing and, and knowing how to push the air through the, the right way. If you watch videos of him, uh, he sings like the greatest classical singers in that from the bottom of his range to the top of his range, there's almost no extraneous movement here. Right. It's all breathing from the diaphragm and putting that air through. And he was, he could do such long phrases and put the breaths 
in uh, odd places that you wouldn't expect. Right. Uh, and and it was so effective when he did that. Um, and I I learned so much from just observing him, listening to him. I learned later that he learned by watching Tommy Dorsey play. Right. And and Tom, because Tommy Dorsey was a master of phrasing, so it all everything goes around in a circle. But it, it, you know, it's so interesting how one can learn or be influenced by working with someone like that. And uh, certainly in the days when Sinatra was working with Dorsey, it was customary for the uh, singers, male and female singers, to sit on a chair in front of the band while the instrumentalists were playing. And it wasn't a vocal tune necessarily, but they would have the instrumentalists up in front of them. They could observe all That's of right. that. And you know, there's a, a famous story uh, with Pavarotti. When he was a young singer, he was on a tour with Joan Sutherland, who, you know, was one of the greatest uh, singers and technical singers as well, as I understand. And um, it, it, they would share arias, you know, uh, first Sutherland would sing and then Pavarotti and back and forth. But he kept noticing, sitting behind her, how large uh, her body became when she would inhale. Mm. And Pavarotti was more of a natural singer he had learned from his dad, really, but maybe not in as technical a manner as Joan Sutherland understood the voice. And so he learned from Joan Sutherland and inquired and, you know, and, and, and improved his singing by observing another wonderful singer. It, it's amazing how much we can learn just, you know, taking advantage of yeah. that, working with I, one another. I got to work with Mel Torme for about almost seven years on and off. and. He had that natural uh, ability, too, to just push the air through and sing these effortless, long phrases, you yeah. know. Um, such a beautiful voice. Yeah, yeah. Such a, and a great, great musician, oh. you know, great, great instrument he had, too. And, uh, and, and what became a decent arranger. Yes, he, and yeah. a great, good piano player, yeah. good drummer. And good drummer, yeah. But, you know, now, just thinking about all this over the years, you know, if I do a master class... I reduce it to telling students, you know, uh, the five minute version of, of, of the phrasing is when you, when you're lying on your back at rest, you're breathing down here. That's the only time you're naturally breathing the way you're supposed to be breathing. Right. And, when gra you play. and how much gravity allows that to happen. Yeah. So that if we can, yes. Yeah. And if I yeah. ask you to blow on a dot on the wall, you wouldn't go, <sighs> you go, <sighs> and it's about learning how to concentrate the airflow and put it through the instrument. Uh, and, you know, you should have, if you want to have a uniform sound from the bottom to the top of your horn, or your voice, as Sinatra did, as Mel Torme did, uh, it's all about breathing, you know, and having a resonant opening, resonant space here. And, uh, no, as te much and no tension. No tension, yeah which I also refer to as economy of movement. You want to have the least amount of extraneous movement in here and in here, as you can get away with, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and, and certainly there's so much uh, video evidence now of Sinatra singing, and certainly in the 50s and 60s, which I always felt were his greatest periods, uh, either on TV shows or even recordings that they did with Nelson Riddle, yeah. and they showed him, you know, in the studio. But there's so much wonderful... A video evidence for free on YouTube to yeah. be able to see Sinatra in those wonderful years. Uh, yeah. And Ella Fitzgerald too, Ella I think Fitzgerald was, was too, of another course. one, yeah. Yeah, just like that. But yeah. that's that's a wonderful uh, example to set because you, you do have beautiful sounds on all your instruments. And your clarinet sound in jazz, one would say, is a very uh, uh, legit type of sound yeah. and in a sense, uh, and you have such beautiful control over the instrument. Uh, the sound, the vibrato, your pitch. I mean, it's something that um, we find in only the very, very best jazz clarinet players throughout history. Well, and, uh, th I thank you for saying that. And that's what I strive for because, you know, my guy, when I first started playing, it wasn't Benny. It was Jimmy Hamilton first because Jimmy, to me, if for people that don't know, Jimmy Hamilton was with Duke Ellington for a long right. time. And sounded like he could have played in a symphony orchestra. Absolutely. And, and you know, I found this out uh, through a discussion with Stanley Drucker, who told me that Jimmy Hamilton actually had studied with Rushenoff. Really? And, wow. and and there was someone else, maybe Bellison as well. Well, that makes that? perfect sense. Yeah. Because he played, again, with that economy of movement that great classical clarinet players yes. have. And apparently he really didn't play saxophone until he really joined the Ellington oh. band that he, he was hired to play the clarinet chair. Yeah, that, and he know. had a completely different approach on the tenor. Yes. Which I learned from, too, 
And I try to treat them as two separate instruments, but he had a kind of a gruff, you know, growling sound on the tenor. Yeah. But he played so beautifully on the clarinet with that round, dark yeah. sound. And I always thought, why shouldn't you play that way just because you play jazz? Right. You know, it. one thing bothers me. Like, I, look, I love the whole spectrum of jazz clarinetists. I like all the New Orleans guys, you know, uh, Jimmy Noon, uh, Edmund Hall, Albert Nichols. I love all that stuff, George Lewis. But if you're a young schooled musician, it strikes me as a little odd that you'd just, that's your go-to sound is that kind of funky, you know, slightly flat, you know, well, clarinet sound. Well, those musicians didn't have the benefit. They of, didn't, but of now school, people but do. now people do, right. You know, and, that's true. and why limit yourself to one approach? Like, what would it sound like if you tried to play like a legit player, had a beautiful sound that was in tune and, and round and dark, you know, it's a whole different way of approaching it. Well, certainly Benny, uh, yeah. probably being the ultimate example of that in the early years, uh, sort of changed that. Yes. Uh, and then Artie, to a, maybe a somewhat lesser degree, but it was schooled, and then, of course, Buddy DeFranco, and then we, Eddie Daniels, yeah. I mean, and, and you, I mean, Ronnie Odrich, I mean, there's a, a clear, uh, influence from the orchestral clarinet sound as being a focused yeah. sound with a lot of core. Well, you know, I think you just hit the nail on the head. A lot of those, all of those players have practiced classical music and performed it too. So that's a big influence on the jazz playing also. Right. And that should be interesting for those who are doublers who are listening to this because I have found uh, certainly in my generation and younger generations that if they didn't start on the clarinet first yeah. and start with a so-called quote-unquote classical approach, meaning studying classe and Behrman and Rose and, and some of the repertoire, having that as a foundation, that if, they, if people who become doublers go to the clarinet, that sometimes they try to negate that or, or don't That's emphasize right. that. And my experiences have been that it never really works. Yeah. It it really doesn't work. The clarinet is too hard. It's it's an unforgiving instrument. Yeah, and you know? and certain basics have to be dealt with. Uh, I mean, can you imagine a pianist uh, not having some background in some of the uh, st uh, quote unquote classical approach to technique and using your fingers and finger? I mean, can you imagine if McCoy didn't have that right. or Herbie I know. or Chick Corea yeah. or Keith Jarrett? I mean, you know, the modern heroes. Uh, certainly, you can hear that influence in Bud Powell and Art Tatum. Of course I mean, you can. I mean, yeah. you know, so why not on the clarinet or even to some That's degree right. the saxophone? And, and frankly, it helps you. You know, if yeah. uh, I tell students all the time, you know, I practice, 80% of what I do is practicing classical etudes. I just pull out those books and go through all of them. The Jean Jean studies, Rose studies, Reginald Kell's staccato studies. Yeah. Goes on and on. Yeah. And most of that transfers over to the saxophone, not the other way around necessarily. Yes. And, and what I do when I pick up the saxophone is just remind myself of the sound, you know, and how I want that to be different. And, but I find most of my technical exercise, I can get away with just focusing on the clarinet and then I still have that because I remind myself on the saxophone, I still want to be curled around the, the horn just kind of pivot and not have a lot of extra movement right. on both instruments. Right. Um, and that all comes from legit studies and, and reminding myself of all that stuff. And it just locks into focus. And also when you're going through the etude books, you're learning chord changes. You're playing arpeggios. You're getting a sense of key memory. Sure. You know, how you'll be able to negotiate in D flat a little <laughs> better because you've played all those exercises. Absolutely. Although it's never going to be as good as C major. You know, let's face it. Uh, maybe uh, for Eddie Daniels, yes. <laughs> Not for me. I'll admit that to everyone. <laughs> well, that's, that's true for all of us. Uh, you know, um, Buddy DeFranco, many years ago when I had a chance to finally meet one of my heroes and, and get to know him a little bit, uh, told me that uh, before he would go out on a tour, uh, the two weeks prior, he would start the first like 10 days 
only on classical stuff, mm. on, on the books and stuff. And then about three or four days before you go out, he thought he would practice working jazz and on the tunes he was going to do. But he, he would get back to the regiment. He said it would always, he felt it would purify him, get the cobwebs out, yeah. get the horn in gear. And somehow he fe you know, be felt better. Yeah, and uh, he, he was quite the practicer oh, too. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And uh, he has that wonderful book out uh, for clarinet based on Hannon's studies. Yes. Uh, Forget the name. Forget hand the name on too, hand on Hannon or something like that. Yeah. But he was a he, he played at my university a number of years ago, and he did a, a a clinic in the morning. We had lunch, and then I drove him back to his hotel before the evening concert. And uh, then I went back to the hotel to pick him up to drive him to the school for the evening concert. And in between, he 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 had practiced. And I said, really, didn't you want to rest up? He said, no, I've got to get my hour in of, uh, of studies and all of that. And I, and I asked him, what did you practice? He said, class A. Mm. And, I th and, he, and Buddy at the time was uh, 80 years old. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'd been playing the horn for probably, you know, 70 years by yeah. that time or whatever. It's like, it never ends. It never ends. And, well, and, I talked to Benny, one of Benny's daughters uh, last year, Rachel. She told me that Benny Goodman practiced four hours a day up till the end that's some that's some devotion you know dedication to the instrument I, and, and and uh when i was writing my woodwood book i had the honor and pleasure of meeting al galadora mm. I, I went upstate and we uh two different times but um the first time i met him i, I said mr galadora are you still practicing every morning three hours <laughs> He said, but then he'd look up and said, but I'm not as good as I once was. <laughs> and I think he was 85 at the time. Oh, I, I, mean, yeah. I mean, you know, so I think that's one of the great things about music that, you, you, you know, you're always going to be able to practice and play uh, and, and play at a high level. Yeah. And also it's a never ending learning process. Right. Playing music. Right. I, I, a good friend of mine is Dick Hyman, who's uh, wow. now, uh, what is he, 90? Two or ninety three this year. He's down in Florida now. Yeah, he's right? down in Florida. But we play together yeah. quite a bit, and he still sounds amazing. He's a guy who spent his whole life as one big learning opportunity. He absorbs everything that's out there. Right. Never stops practicing, writing, you know, doing projects. And that's why you should be a musician and not a plumber, because there's that's only so right. much you can do as right. a plumber. <laughs> that's um, right. But, uh, Who needs money? Yeah, right. <laughs> Job security now. Come on. Yeah, which they have. <laughs> yeah, but you can't say our lives are not interesting because they are. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so how did you get from Cleveland to New York and and practice? Sort of... <laughs> 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 oh man, what what actually drove you okay. to finally to come? Here's here? what happened. Uh, I went to college for two years, Cleveland State, just to keep studying with this clarinet teacher, Al Blazer. Um, got an offer to go on the road with the Tommy Dorsey band led by Buddy Morrow. Yes. Who was one of the legends of, of New York studio, older wave of studio guys, uh, was on the Tommy Dorsey band, led the Tommy Dorsey band for much longer than Tommy did. Uh, almost kind of died with his boots on, led, led that band up until uh, his 90s, I think. And uh, uh, anyway, I was on that band for two and a half years. Playing lead, he gave me a spot on lead alto and a clarinet feature spot for like 15 minutes with the rhythm section. Wow. And what a great, what a great opportunity. It was a great opportunity. And the discipline of being on that band 48 weeks out of the year on the road, one nighters playing, trying to be consistent from night to night and picking his brain about everything. That really uh, was a, m made a quantum leap forward in my own playing and, and ways of thinking about music. So many things. Just, for example, like having to stand up and play uh, eight bars or 16 bars of a solo and making it count for something uh, every night, you know, just those kinds of challenges and always trying to ho hone your own playing and hone the sections playing. We, we really took pride in that band. I know it was a ghost band, but it was a great band at that time. And that was, I caught basically the tail end of the big bands, you know? Right. And a lot of the guys would go on and join the Buddy Rich band and Woody's band. And we would do concerts with all, all those bands. And I actually got called to do the Buddy Rich band, but I'd been living in New York and didn't want to go back out on the road. But uh, anyway, I was on that band for about two and a half years. 
And every time, uh, especially if you were the lead player, if you threatened to leave, he would give you a very infinitesimal raise, <laughs> enough just to keep you going. <laughs> so after a few of these, he calls me into his hotel room and he gave me a big speech and he said, he said, I'll let you go if you promise you'll move to New York and not go back to Cleveland. And you know, wow. I don't, you should not be a big fish in a small pond. Right. You should go where you're going to be challenged. And he gave me this whole speech about how, you know, you should always try to play with people better than yourself. And so many things I learned from him. But but he really, they changed my life. He and the road manager on that band, a guy named Leif Peterson, who was the singer too, was still a friend of mine. Um, they really changed my life. Uh, and How, how me old were you at York. this time? So I was, um, let's see, 20. So I would have been uh, 20, 21. On the know? band. So uh -huh. I moved to New York when I was about 22. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, wow, where a lot of kids are juniors and seniors in college and just going through the exams. You, know, you were living the life and really learning. And, yeah, uh, and, and here's, a, here's a weird thing, too. Uh, uh, without you know, going into great psychoanalysis, I did have a rough childhood and lots of you know, weird disciplining from both parents and uh, kind of arbitrary punishments and things. My, when they called me to go on the road, my mother took the phone call and didn't tell me. And luckily, they wanted me badly enough that they called back a month later and I answered the phone. <laughs> My life would have been completely different. Isn't that amazing? It, it's, it's funny. These little paths it, it, it opened the changed my life. Yeah. Well, uh, this recalls a, an earlier interview on the Legacy series with an ex-teacher of mine who's no longer with us, Paul Dunkel, who uh, wanted to go to Curtis and had applied and sent his application in. And he realized he never got a, an audition date, and the mother had intercepted the <laughs> the uh, letter and never told him about it. So the end result was Paul ended up going to Queens College, and and he did fine. He did fine, fine. and he ended That's up right. studying with William Kincaid anyway on, privately. So, but but you know the mother took control it, and was yeah. trying to prevent him yeah. from that. So <laughs> it, yeah. it's sort of sometimes it's in the stars. That's uh, right. You know, and he even Buddy Morrow even set up an interview with the Willard Alexander Agency. Because just around that time, they were putting together the Artie Shaw band for Artie, who was still alive. Right. And, and Buddy thought that it would be nice to have this young clarinetist, me, leading the band. That didn't work out, but it was so nice that he even thought to he do sounds that like he me. was really a, a mentor to you, but someone who was so in your corner. Yeah. Uh, and that's every, every young player needs that yeah. at some point early in the career. That's right. And that, that sounds like you were really fortunate to have Buddy Morrow there. I you. was, you know, and then even after I moved to New York, uh, again, I, I was lucky. I, took, I caught the last wave of the great musicians, I would say, of kind of the swing to straight ahead circuit, you know, Milt Hinton, uh, Arvel Shaw, uh, you know, Hank Jones, Bucky Pizzarelli, uh, um, uh, Marion McPartland, you know, all these people were so nice and supportive wow. and it really was like a family. They would test you first, you know, yeah. put you through the ringer a little bit, but, but you were welcome. You know, Milt Hinton, of course I had him on a zillion records before I moved to New York and I get a phone call from him and I hadn't met him up to this point. He says, you know, is this Ken Pavlosi? Yeah. He says, this is the judge, Mel Tinton. Uh, he says, I've been hearing about you. He says, I think we should meet. And he had his, he had his home in Queens and he had a, a place in New York too because he did so much studio work. Right. So he invites me over to his apartment in New York. He says, bring your horns. So I brought my tenor and clarinet and he, he had his bass and we were just playing duets. That was his way of welcoming me into the fold. <sighs> Man. And it wasn't just me. He did that with every young jazz musician. Wow. To the day he died. I almost start crying thinking about this. He, he was so giving. You know, he's just an amazing person. Uh, this, that's another era of music and, and another era of a human being. Yeah, it uh, is. And, and that's yeah. something we, we, we really could use more of. Right? Yeah. But so obviously you're... Uh, experience on the big band as a young player was very important to you. And, and certainly today, 
you know, we don't have those bands going out. I mean, um, certainly not for that length of time. Right. So uh, the young players have an opportunity, and perhaps the only opportunity to play in a big band is at their colleges. Yeah. You know, even rehearsal bands are far and few between today compared to what it used to be. So if you could put into a few words for the young players listening, what you felt and you feel the importance of big band playing is to the development, certainly of a, a, a multi-woodwind instrumentalist yeah. to be. How, how would you describe that? Yeah, uh, I, I'll talk about that. And not just that, but doing, as we all did, I'm sure you did too, doing lots of bad weddings <laughs> and dances oh, yeah. where you're just faking <laughs> tunes. tunes. There's just such a value to that, Absolutely. you know. And in oh. fact, just as an aside, the first one of the first weddings I played in New York was here was the band. It was Milt Hinton on bass, uh, Mel Lewis on drums, oh, God. Steve Kuhn on piano, oh, my gosh. Bucky, and the other saxophone player was Buddy Tate, who was the oh, veteran my of the Count Basie band. This is a band playing somebody's <laughs> wedding. And let me guess, the people at the wedding are coming up and saying, you're rushing, you're rushing. <laughs> <laughs> or, or why don't you play this? You know, uh, but there we are, just taking requests. And, you know, but there were, that was a thing, too, like learning, faking songs, learning uh, 50 Cole Porter songs, learning the verses, being able to just play a song that you've never heard, you've never played before, but it's in the back of your head somehow. That was all so valuable. And the big band thing too. And it's, it's a lot of that is about the repetition of doing something and being thrust into the moment. Here, here's what a lot of young players don't get the opportunity to do. It's, you can practice all you want. But there's a difference between practicing and actually playing in a real setting. I don't care what that setting is. It changes the focus. It, it, the adrenaline kicks in. There's a sense of, of a laser being focused that you have to bring to the table when you're actually playing for an audience, whether that's a big band dance, because you've got to keep the dancers on the floor. You have to have the tempo has to be the same. It has to have a groove to it. Um, or you're playing a wedding and you have to sort of play these requests and uh, you know keep people's attention. Or you're playing a club somewhere. You got to keep the audience focused. There's such a value to that. Um, and the discipline in the big bands of, as I said before, playing the same music over and over, and not being jaded or tired about it. The trick is to keep finding nuances in that music and be able to, on the 50th night you've played Opus One, <laughs> being able to play it as sharp and as if it's fresh for the audience as it was on night one, Right. you know? Right. Because you should never stop thinking about that. Then you don't get bored, right. you know? Right. I actually, frankly, because now I do a, a guests with orchestras, I do pops concerts. I see some of these orchestra musicians They've forgotten about what it means to, to the joy of playing music. They're, they're sitting there. They've become the kind of sidemen right. that just sit there and look at their watch and complain about the concertmaster. Every violinist complains that they're not the they're concertmaster. Like... <laughs> they all complain about the conductor. Right. Whatever instrument the guest soloist plays, you know, they, they, they should play, be there. They're right. <laughs> you know, but, but it's like if I was doing a job like that, I would, you know, just for your own amusement... So you, so you don't drive yourself crazy. Still try to get the music out of, of the piece you're playing, you know? That's the, the most beautiful classical players sound like the greatest jazz players. If you listen to Pablo Casals playing the, the unaccompanied, the Bach cello sonatas, you know, it sounds like a guy in a room improvising. And he recorded them a number of times, different times. <laughs> That's right. And they were all different, and they're different yes. each time. The Berlin Philharmonic with von Karajan, I believe, recorded three sets of the entire Beethoven cycle of symphonies yeah. at three different points in his career. Different tempi, different approaches yes. to it. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of the same musicians. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, probably a majority of the orchestra is the same from the first to the last rendition, yes, uh, but com very different readings. So it, that's so true. And Benny, you know, I played in Benny's last band, and uh, he would never stop thinking about those Fletcher Henderson charts and the perfect tempo and making little edits. And to him, it was a nostalgic exercise. It was alive music, you know. 
and he always sounded energetic and playing it even when he's you know in the last few years of his life yeah, he so much it. energy yeah, and there's a, such an art to that let's just take him playing memories of you which he probably did over a thousand times thousands of times avalon poor butterfly and always sounding to the audience like that's the first time they ever heard it you know louis armstrong could do that too yes uh but so my lesson to young people is yeah you probably aren't going to have those experiences but then you've got to recreate those as much as you can by getting out and finding playing opportunities right as much as you possibly can there are some really adventurous young musicians there that are just creating these opportunities for themselves uh, they're great at you know hustling jobs wherever they can right it, that's so important you know as I said you know you can practice all you want in a room but it, it does something else to be playing with other musicians in a room full of people right. it, it's just different I can't tell you why right. but it is and you've got to get those opportunities right um. All right, let's just switch course for a little bit on moving on with your career. How did your solo career, which is now a good 30 plus years, uh, really, and, and a good amount of, of CDs under your name. I mean, you really have been uh, quite uh, prodigious in that regard. And, uh, and we're going to feature some of those CDs, certainly uh, throughout the video and with little audio links uh, in the beginning and end of the video. But how did that evolve? How did that come to fruition? Well, I mean, my goal, even back in the polka band days, was I wanted to be a jazz musician. And, and, and because after I moved to New York, I was known as a clarinet player because there weren't a lot of clarinet players around then. I got called to sub on a lot of the more traditional jazz gigs. The, the last version of Eddie Condon's was still in there right in midtown manhattan right jimmy down. ryan's was there yeah the street was still alive that's a right uh so I, I would sub on those bands and to be honest i didn't know those tunes that repertoire but i they were nice to me and let me listen and you know figure out the form and then i would maybe solo last and and max kaminsky would hire me for gigs jimmy and marion mcpartland uh the drummer named buzzy Dritton. So there was a lot of that kind of work too um, and so I found my way through that door and then at the same time I was there were a lot of rehearsal bands then tons tons and there was a guy named Lauren Schoenberg who's still around who uh, lives around the corner that's right yeah <laughs> so he, Lauren is now a big guy at the uh, Jazz Museum of Harlem right but Lauren had a, one of the great big bands in the 80s uh, and early 90s and Mel Lewis was a regular member Danny Bank you, you know, most of these guys, Eddie yeah. Burt, Bobby Pring, and then some of the younger guys. And I was playing in that yeah. band. And uh, so back then you do a rehearsal. And so you've, you've now met 15 to 17 other musicians. They've all got gig possibilities, you know. So every every rehearsal is an opportunity to meet people, expand your, your thing. And, yeah. Yeah. and I love, I loved and love the whole spectrum of jazz. I like playing all kinds of music. So um, I was playing a lot at a club that was around in the 80s called Jays, which was on 90, 97th and Broadway. Right, upstairs. Yeah. And we had such a following there that we'd actually, we'd have a line of people going down onto the street. I sort of, I lived on the Upper West Side. I remember that. And Bill Charlotte played Bill there Charlotte, a lot. Bill everybody played yeah, everybody, there. Yeah. John Pizzarelli played there in the yeah. early days. Yeah. Um, and I was also, I was working Monday nights in Freeport, Long Island, playing tenor with an organ trio at a place called Mr. Hicks uh, and playing that kind of music. Huh. Um, and also they got a kick out of me playing clarinet on some of those tunes too, because <laughs> nobody had ever done that before. Uh, but uh, so just all kinds of different gigs. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of my friends where this kind of younger group of jazz musicians that were into standards-based jazz, playing songs right. for the most part. Uh, Scott Hamilton, Warren Vache, a little bit older than me, but around the same generation. Howard Alden, Dan Barrett, uh, Randy Sankey. And we all kind of found each other, you know, and started doing gigs together and working a lot together. 
And that became an introduction into uh, Carl Jefferson and Concord Jazz, which was one of the last great independent labels. And I did a record for Dan Barrett, the trombonist, uh, and gave Carl Jefferson a demo tape I'd been shopping around. Uh, and Carl listened to it on the flight home and flew me out to California and signed me to the label. And I wow. did 20, 25 records for them. Uh, and he was a great guy, a great mentor. He did the same thing that those independent guys like Norman Grants did, and where he would have a family of musicians, and you'd all play on each other's records, and he'd send you out on package tours. Right. And that opened my world up. I, I met Mel Torme that way, uh, George Shearing, Hank Jones, you know, all these other people, you know, and uh, uh, it was just a great scene and did so much for me, you know, opened up the door to playing in Japan, the place where they really, really, really love jazz music and treat us so well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, doing these recordings, that also, uh, you do a record and it's really um, a ticket to work, you know. If you want to play a festival, they always want to see if you've got an album out or something. Right. So. The more of those I did, the more the profile increases, and uh, so it just kind of ballooned from there. Wow, what a what a wonderful story! And uh, but it all if only it was true. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, but the, the point is, it seems it, it, you know building blocks. Yeah, I mean very uh, clear building blocks, and but always the idea of learning more and I. Again, I, I, the practicing was always happening yeah. and going as you were learning more tunes, practicing, working at night. So it was a constant uh, life yeah. of, of and, playing. Yeah, and, and I also do, I took Buddy's advice to really, uh, and I still think about that. I try to challenge myself all the time. If I feel complacent or just on a plateau, I really try to give myself a kickstart. And now... I'm pl I'm playing some classical festivals again, doing some ridiculous things, and I keep saying, "Why did I take this job?" <laughs> For example, this summer I'm doing the um, I'm playing Stravinsky's Soldier's Tale, the the reduction he wrote, the suite for, for clarinet, for violin, and piano. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is, again, I I say, "Why did I agree to this?" But I because I told myself you need to do this. Yes. Well, that's know? great. But you're gonna love doing it, and it's great music. That's it the is whole great thing. music. It's great yeah. music. And but you have to push yourself. You yes. Know? You well, have that's to keep great. Interesting. Well, that's a wonderful uh, lesson. So many um, players that I have encountered in my career in, in the New York commercial area um, seem to be just satisfied with getting the gigs, and they go from one gig to the other gig, and and. There's nothing wrong with that, yeah. and you're providing for yourself and your family and, and surviving. But musically, I my perception of them is that they've never gone anywhere. It's stayed the same. Maybe it's even dropped. But they, they're not elevating themselves. Yeah. Because if you don't do other stuff and stuff that's, that is musically, that's right. uh, I guess, has musical substance yeah. to it, you can't get better. Well, that's when you become... Like I was talking about earlier with the orchestra, some of the or some of the orchestra musicians, not all of them. Right. But that's when you become that kind of side person, where you're right. just getting through the. It's like punching in the time clock. Right. Then right. why are you playing music? I think I think you have right. to remind yourself once in a while why you're playing music. Right. And find an opportunity to 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 get that joy again out of out of right. It, you know? And it can come in many different ways too. Yeah. I mean, it it can be just. Studying with a new person, exactly, or, or choosing some repertoire to play, like you're doing the Soldier's Tale this summer. Yeah. Uh, something different to move you uh, to. Oh, it, absolutely! It, it, even it, even playing a show for a great performer, you can learn so much from them if you really allow yourself to. Right, you know? right. Uh, it, it's so true. It, it's getting away from the gig meister mentality, yeah. uh, which is so important. Um, Let's just switch gears for a second. Let's talk about your equipment on clarinet and saxophone. Uh, what what equipment uh, do you choose to generally uh, play, in in let's say in your jazz uh, playing? Yeah, well, clarinets I use the Buffet R13, mm -hmm. and actually I use the same setup on everything for classical and jazz. I I, I have a Bur um, Portnoy BPO3 mouthpiece, uh -huh. which I've played almost since I started 
Um, and I met Portnoy. I played out in uh, California and he showed up and he said, oh, I see you're playing my mouthpiece. Uh, and he said, I'm going to send you a couple that I think you'll like even better. And he did. And I did. And so those are the ones I, I have. Wow. And I like them because they're adaptable for me. And, and I appreciate your compliment when you said I sound closer to a legit player on uh, playing jazz. Well, I strive for that, which means with that approach, I don't have to feel like I have to switch equipment to, to play classical. I might just change the read to a slightly harder read sometimes. Right. But I use those Van Doren German cut White Masters, right. number fours generally. Uh -huh. And that works on that mouthpiece for right. me. Uh, and I don't switch. I've stuck with that for years and years. And once in a while, somebody gives me something. And here's my take on all this. It, it can be a real disease with musicians because you're trying to find the answer in the external. And to me, and this is one thing I took from my two lessons with Sonny Stitt. He, he said, the sound comes from here or here, you know, and the instrument is just an amplifier. You have to think of it that way. You have to yes. remind yourself of that. Uh, you just want something that vibrates and stays out of your way. Uh, so you have to remember that you're producing the sound. A lot of my practice, uh, and, and James Moody was like this also, is away from the instrument. I think about music all the time. I think about my sound. I can kind of uh, work through lines over improvising lines over changes all in my head. You can get a lot done away from your horn. Uh, and then when you if, you, if let's say you're busy and you only have 20 minutes to practice, you can really focus on the things that matter the most. You can just lock in, get an etude book out. Uh, I pull them out at random. I keep buying different books. Right. So I'm also practicing my sight reading right. at the same time and my technique and listening to my sound and checking to see if I've got that uniform thing from bottom to top. And then I, you know, the saxophone uh, I've been using for the last 20 years, a, a Yamaha YTS uh, 52. Or, uh, and then I use an old Berg Larsen duckbill mouthpiece. Oh, yeah. Hard rubber. I don't know the opening because when I bought it, it had been opened up. It's about a medium facing. And right. I used uh, Van Doren number four reads on that. And again, that mouthpiece I've used most of my professional life. Wow. Um, once in a while, somebody gives me something to try. Right. And I think, like we all do, you fall in love with a new thing, and then you try your old thing, and, <laughs> and it's like, oh, boy. It's, you're, just, you're just infatuated with the new thing. It's the, your, your mistress. Yeah, but then you go back. <laughs> Hopefully, your, your old mouthpiece will take you back. <laughs> you know. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, you're, you got to trust your instincts. And, right. and uh, uh, we, you, you, players can get into so much trouble. You know, but they, they read the jazz magazines and see so-and-so plays a auto link number eight. And they buy that and don't sound anything like that person. Right. Because your mouth's different. Your teeth are different. Everything's different. Right. You might have to play a completely different setup to get that sound right. if that's what you want. It's true. It's true. So you could you just you got to find something that's comfortable. As I always say, stays out of your way and vibrates the right way you want it to. And that's what counts, you know. Right. But it, 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 and it also depends on the nature of the person. I know for my first 40 years of playing, <laughs> uh, I, I was an equipment fanatic. Now, I'm still always interested in trying stuff and whatnot, but basically I've stayed with the same flute for 30 years now. Mm. I've stayed with the same piccolo for 30 years. Wow. I've stayed with the same, well, I still played buffet R13s for the last 40 years. Mm. Uh, summer saxophones, although recently, I, as I was telling you, I've been playing Yamaha Alto, uh, which I like very much, but I, I, I've quieted down quite a bit. But the first 40 years of playing, the amount of time, money, <laughs> travels, aggravation. I mean, I remember taking a, 
an Amtrak overnight to Chicago with a baritone to get <laughs> Frank Wells to make me oh, a baritone that's mouthpiece. That's right, we all, everybody always went there, Frank Wells, yeah. But, but I mean, going through the cattle country and, sli- and, and didn't, want to, <laughs> didn't want to check the baritone on a plane, so I'd sleep with the baritone, and, and, and there was no room in these little Amtrak things. And I thought, this has got to be the worst night I've ever spent. <laughs> you know, I wasn't in love with the baritone, mind you, but I, I, had a, yeah. I was playing it and I wanted it to sound as good as possible. So I remember those were the type of equipment uh, days that, uh, you know, you look back, but I did learn a lot. I learned, yeah. you eventually learn what is it that, <clears throat> what is it that you're mm. looking for and what is it that makes you happy and recognizing the fact that you're never going to have the best equipment. Yeah. There's always someone who's going to have something you're going to try and say, that's better. Yeah. But you can't always have that's it. That's right. And, and, and um, yeah, you and, know, you know, for me, just because now I'm, I'm really stubborn about this. I don't even want to try people's setups because uh, I don't want to get tempted. Right. But that means that, uh, you know, I might struggle sometimes trying to find the right read or, uh, but you make it work. You, that's the thing you learn. You learn to make it work on every, every playing opportunity. You know, last year uh, in one of these uh, video interviews with Stanley Drucker, he basically said he'd been playing the same Lalande clarinet mouthpiece his whole career. Mm. I mean, from the time he was a kid, like 11 or 12, Leon Rushinoff gave it to him. And we're talking now, Stanley's now 90, 78 years with the same mouthpiece. Yeah. And, I, and I said, uh, didn't you ever you know, try others? And he said, yeah, but I always came back to this, he said, because I had learned to make the reed for that mouthpiece. He learned where to mm. cut, where to shave on the reed. So he understood what he needed for that That's mouthpiece. And he was content to do yeah, that. See? And, and, yeah. and uh, not a bad career. <laughs> yeah, I, you go, oh my God. And yeah. there's a the sound. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so I mean, it, yeah. it, it is interesting. But you know, the, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, I guess, Mark Lopeman, oh, yes. reminds me, I was on the road with him with the Dorsey Band. I just had a conversation with him about this. He reminded me that this whole mouthpiece thing, like when I was on that band, I was methodically going through mouthpieces, trying different things, uh, like every maybe once a week I'd f- focus on a different one. But then I settled on something, on alto uh, then, and clarinet, and and then didn't change, you know. So I guess I went through that process in a more concentrated, shorter, right, ter- fashion, you know. Well, also being on the road, you're looking for some diversion. That's sometime. right, and, and and also there is a, because we're playing the same arrangements every night, so you, right. So you can't get a better test than that, right. you know. And, okay, so now I'm playing this. How does this match up to what I just played last right. week? The right. same piece of music. Right. You know? Well, you know, I, I've written an article on my website about that uh, with regards to doing shows, Broadway shows, yeah. where you're playing the same thing. And how do you avoid the boredom that would naturally set in? And one of those ways is to learn about equipment through mm. that. And you can find out what equipment maybe for a certain style of music gives you the best response, gives you the best legato, gives you the best tone color for that style of music. Sure. I mean, you know, so you can use those type of situations because of the fixed musical situation like you're You're playing. right, you know. You know yeah, it, and also, you know, for example, you, you hit on something there. S- styles of music. Now, I'm, I don't re- actually consider myself a, a classic doubler in the sense that I long ago gave up all, a lot of the extra instruments. I, I was never a good flute player. Um, in fact, I gave, I literally gave away all my extra instruments to students that needed horns. Wow. Uh, bass clarinet, I never liked my sound on it. I stopped playing alto just because I, so I focus on the tenor and the clarinet and I treat them almost as two separate instruments with two different approaches. But a tenor, I favor a kind of breathy, subtony sound which I've made work for myself and I can articulate even in the lower register by doing that sound. That means though that I couldn't play a legit thing on, with that setup on tenor. Right. I would have to change equipment. Right. And even certain kinds of studio jobs, uh, I was never a, I was never the A team of that kind of call. I've done a fair amount of, of work over the years of, of studio dates, but I think what what I've done for myself is made it so they call me when they want my approach and my sound. Right. And even if I'm playing 
a pop date or a rock thing or something that's different, I, I say to myself, since they called me, they want what I do, so I'm not going to change my sound or setup for that. But that's not the case for people that are trying to get different kinds of jobs because right. there's no question, I'd be the first to admit, my tenor setup would not work on certain kinds of things. Right. Yeah, well, and that's a conscious choice you've made, and because your career has moved in a certain way, and you are known as a soloist now, you have gravitated to that point. You're a well-known soloist internationally, and, and uh, you shouldn't have to worry about that at that point. But for young players who might be watching this, who are developing as saxophonists and clarinetists, uh, doublers and flutists and double reeds perhaps, there's a number of choices you have to make yeah. and you have to be adaptable to uh, so many styles, more styles now than, for instance, the guys in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. who were the doublers. Now there's so many more styles and, and the nature of rock and fusion and funk has changed yeah. and the nature of, uh, you know, what's expected of a saxophone soloist is different than what it was in the 50s. I yeah. mean, if, if, if you were playing, let's say, a successful tenor saxophone uh, soloist in the studios like Plaz Johnson. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about yeah. the beautiful Plaz Johnson. Yeah. What not? But now if you're putting him into a funk and fusion setting now, that style of playing wouldn't fit. That's so you, right. so yeah. if you're a young saxophonist and a doubler and whatnot, you'd have to have different setup, different conception to be successful. Uh, That's and to, very and true. And then to be recalled. Yeah. Also, I think the nature of, of the way music sounds, uh, post everything being electric, you know, and synthesized. It, it means that a lot of saxophone players now have a more edgy, bright, thin sound. Which works in recording studios. Yeah, because it, it cuts above all, the, all that electronic right. noise. And you the know? engineers love it. They, yeah. they, they love doing that. Yeah, that's out of necessity, you know. Right. Uh, it's, I, I refer to it kind of as the post-Michael Brecker sound, and that's a testament to him. That's not a, that's not a denigrating, because he was... He was a, just a phenomenal saxophonist. Uh, w one thing, though, that I do question, when I hear young players, uh, they, they, actually a lot of them don't even know who Mike Brecker was. It's post-Chris Potter and I, beyond. Is, yes, isn't that amazing? Which all comes is, from is, him. Isn't that astonishing? But why is that your only choice? Like, what if you just listen to Ben Webster and Lester Young? And, and I mean, wouldn't it be interesting if you were a young tenor saxophone player and you tried a slightly darker, you know, rounder, you know, breathy sound, uh, why are you limiting yourself? And again, that's a weird uh, dichotomy. Like these young musicians, they've got the entire spectrum of, of recorded music at the touch of, of, a, of a computer. And they're only listening to the top, you know, 20% of what's happened in jazz music. Oh. Well, some of it may be, uh, some of it is young, being youthful, and that's what we tended to do. Who were the hot players at the time? When I was in school uh, and you were looking at tenor saxophone, it was Coltrane. There was yeah. no other choice. It was right. Coltrane. And so then it became, in the next generation, Michael Brecker, yeah. and now it's, it's, it's Chris Potter, yeah. or, and, then, and then there was Joe Lovano. But I do also hear a lot of young players sort of influenced by Joe Henderson. So... Uh, maybe it's not as draconian. Yeah. Well, I as, do find uh, these refreshing examples yes. once in a while where yes. somebody, in fact, if I do a college date and I hear somebody with a more, for lack of a better word, old-fashioned sound, I single them out and say, just stay with that. Because actually, you're going to get phone calls because you're, you're different from everybody right. else. It's a, that's a, yeah, it's a, now. so it goes full circle yeah, the other yeah. way. You know, I did a... a uh, one of those package tours in Japan, and Mike Brecker was there with the with the quartet, and uh, the Japanese. Let's face it. The, well, back in those days, they paid so well, and they would make very strong requests, which you'd pretty much have to play, you know, because they paid you to do this, and y you you wanted to respect their audiences. And with Mike Brecker, they they made him play standards. Really? Yeah. So I'm listening to this guy, you know, going. There's nothing that I couldn't even approach what he does on the saxophone. It, like, so phenomenal every night. Mike was Technically, a genius. I've never heard anything. Just, just astounding. Yeah. And, you know, I was a little intimidated by him. So after three Only days... Only a little? Well, you know. <laughs> Man, so, you're doing yeah. well. <laughs> but after three days, he came up to me and he said, 
He said, I just want you to know, I really have a lot of respect for what you do. He said, because I'm having trouble finding my way into playing, playing these kinds of songs. Huh. Which just means that uh, it kind of ties in with my thing of, you know, why not listen to the whole spectrum of jazz? Like, it's interesting. Like, I could never do what he did, but he felt I would have disagreed with him. But he felt he couldn't do what I did or, right. or what, what a Stan Getz could do or a Zoot Sin. It's a different way of playing. Right. But he was also someone who listened. He listened to everybody. Everything. It was the nicest person oh. on earth and so supportive of, of every musician. You know, when Mike uh, came out to this university to do a concert years ago where I was teaching, he had just come off the road and he had come into the uh, studio that I had and, you know, I had a lot of books, woodwind books and stuff. And, you know, Mike, would, he spent time, he said, oh, let me, he's pulling this out. And I think he, I said, take him, man. It, you know, he, there were at least three or four books he walked away with. Jazz history, woodwind playing, uh, breathing concepts, yeah. uh, 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 classical harmony, Schoenberg harmony book. I and mean, he was infatuated by everything. Yes, he was studying Bulgarian music at yeah. the end of his life. Yes. Yeah. And he, he studied composition seriously for many years, and, and that proved very fru fruitful for him. And yeah. The last 10 or 15 years of in his own compositions on his recordings. But that's the type of musician that you had alluded to earlier. Constantly searching, yeah. constantly engaged. Yeah, and positive and yeah. nice and not threatened by anybody. And actually, his brother's the same same kind of person. hundred percent. Sweet guy. Yeah. And who loved the deli that we're going to go to <laughs> oh, <laughs> in a few good. minutes. <laughs> Randy still uh, loves that. But um, you, you alluded to a little bit earlier. What is it that you actually practice on tenor uh, and, uh, and on uh, clarinet as far as the actual books and stuff? You alluded to uh, uh, Behrman and maybe... Yeah, the and John Cora, John studies. John John. I love those because they're... They take you through all the keys. They're technically challenging, and they're also musical. Uh, now, when you, are you talking about the eighteen etudes there's, or, or there's the Vatican Make Hume? Any of those John John? Yeah, books. There, there's, there's, there's numerous. There's numerous. Yeah, right. I love all of them. I and I really do pull them out at random and practice many things at one time. Sight reading, uh, you know, just scanning a page and trying to play in time without stopping. Right. And then later, I'll go back and, and fix passages that felt bad. Right. Um, and if I particularly feeling like, if I gave a performance where I felt like my breathing was wrong, I'll focus on, on long tones and just play bottom to top and try to, like I said before, try to have a uniform mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. And I do practice more on clarinet than on saxophone. Okay. Uh, Do you practice more jazz on saxophone than on clarinet? Um, that would be about even. Uh -huh. I'll, uh, but I'd say 80% of practicing is, is classical stuff. Then I'll pull out a song that I want to learn or a piece somebody wrote for me or something and, and go through it on my horn, think about the changes, play through it. Mm -hmm. I might play it on a, on a keyboard first to get the sound of the changes in my head because it's hard with with a one note instrument to intellectualize chord changes. It's important to, to, to get the sound in your head of, of what the changes are like too. Right, do, do you, how do you dissect when you're learning a tune? Do you have any uh, process that you go through or is it just playing the tune over and over again, playing the changes at the piano, singing maybe? And I mean, do you have any specific process that um, you use? What, well, one thing I do, uh, if I'm learning it, um, I always get the original, if it's a song, because I'm a song person. I've got a huge collection of old song folios, song books, sheet music. I'm always looking for things to play. I, don't, I never considered myself a great composer. So I try to find my way into other people's material. But I do learn lyrics and, and, and music and because it's important to know the intent of the song. It doesn't mean you have to have the lyrics memorized. But I think if you're going to play a ballad, it's nice to know if it's a wrist slashing song about the woman <laughs> left you or if it's a happy, you know, yeah. it, it, me, it means something, you know. Sure. And I've been inspired by listening to all these great vocalists that we talked about uh, and many more, you know, Billie Holiday and, you know, it, it goes on and on. But so I always practice from a, first from a C part and okay. transpose.
Okay. That's enough because it's again making me think, uh, getting my sense of relative pitch. That's to me. That's so important to be able to. Uh, if I think of a song, I think of the relationship of the notes, almost like it in a in a. You can draw a like line. A graph. You know, a graph. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so by tr always transposing, you know, from a C part, uh, I'm just using my ears and, and getting that sense of the motion of, of the right. notes and not, not learning A flat to B flat to A. I'm just learning the relationship. You know, th it starts yeah. for here and goes up a step, then, you know, right. and doing it um, subconsciously. I'm not even consciously trying to do it, you know. <laughs> It, but again, it's a funny thing. I could practice, you know, uh, till till I'm red in the face. Practice a song, but it really helps me focus when I when I do it on the job. If I'm playing with other musicians, playing in a band, uh, playing in a club, th I learn on the job. I I'll if I'm working um, four nights in a club, I'll play seventy percent things that I've been playing and then throw in some new things that I'll read, you know, until I have it down. Interesting. That helps me focus. Interesting. Uh, for some wow. reason, you know. Yeah. I think it's also that, because I'm in the band and I'm listening to everything going on at the same time, the harmony, you know. Yeah, but, uh, be, but having to be put on the spot, it, it's true. Uh, you, you know, there's nothing like being put onto the gun yeah. to know what you really do know. Right, and if you don't have that uh, chance, uh, then cr you have to create it for yourself as as true as possible to that. Like, even if it's just getting together with friends and playing, that's one step closer than just playing by yourself in a room. Right. Because, like I said, it's hard to intellectualize chord changes and things like that and keep the time going without a little bit of help at first, right. you know? Right, right, right. Um, but uh, I always give the example of Sonny Stitt learn songs so well and he could play he pick just randomly pick the keys of songs you know he could play with ease you know and now, i remember hearing in a club when i was in college down in carl gables florida i couldn't possibly remember the name it's going back uh 40 45 years and i remember him coming up to the band saying house rhythm section okay cherokee and b Mm. Halfway through, all right, we're modulating A flat. I mean, he just kept going oh, yeah, down. Because Actually, I think he, he went down the diminished chord B, A flat, F, mm. D. It, it went down that yeah. way. And, and, and I felt so bad for the guys up there, you know, sweating them. Yeah. And, but he, 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 is there anything he couldn't play perfectly? He was, yeah. he was like a perfect well, sax player. Yeah, and here's the thing you, could, you can actually pull him, if you have the ability to pull him out of a record and just listen to him. Everything's there. You hear every, yeah, every the time, harmony. the harmonies, right? This the singing sense of the arc of a melody. It's all there. Yeah. 
that's probably from a lifetime of playing with local rhythm sections, a lot of them not so good, right. where he had to provide all that information. But he right. became so strong that way. Yes, yes. Uh, but I think about things like that. And so even in my practicing, I try to be my own metronome and keep aware of, of the, the form of the song always and not lose right. that and, and the changes, right. you know. Um, right. So it's a two-step process. It's, it's doing it by myself right. and then actually in the moment where everything gains this focus. Right, right. Interesting. We'll do a Desert Island thing. Your favorite albums. If you had, let's say, five albums, your favorite five albums. It doesn't only have to be clarinet plays, but just, I mean, who? what are the albums that are most meaningful to you that if you could cite, besides yeah. your own? <laughs> Why, thank you. Uh, Duke Ellington, The Great Paris Concert. It's... It's a concert of Duke's great band with Paul Gonzalez and Jimmy Hamilton, that band, from the mid-1960s, recorded so well. The best example of, of Duke there is, because everything's there. All these great, the, the soloists, the compositions, the arrangements. If you want to get into the world of Duke, that's it. Um, uh, the Beatles, Abbey Road. To me, yeah, they they went out with a bang. That's their last album, and it's a great album. Uh, and for all the jazz snobs out there, I'm going to quote Paul McCartney, who said, "Some said he was saying, well, uh, would you agree that the White Album would have been better as a solo album, or maybe it's not as good as this?" And he goes, "We were the bloody Beatles, so shut up." <laughs> they were. <laughs> Come on, they're great. They're, they're fantastic yeah. compositions. As a band playing together, everything. You know, there's a commercial that's currently being aired. Uh, I think it's a Google commercial, and they use the back uh, in the backdrop the, uh, the recording "Help." Yeah. yeah and, and I, you know, just listening to it, walking through the house, I say, "Damn, it! It still sounds better than any, you know, pop group." There's something yes. there. There's a, it's it maybe a, a, there's a passion, there's an energy. It's but the, everything. And, it, it, in a the sense, chemistry. It's. it's the odds of for those four people getting together. Yeah, and, isn't yeah. that amazing after all these years? Yeah, it is. And, you know, again, I actually get very, I get as excited to talk about this as we did about a certain president before. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, drummers that like to put down Ringo Starr, you try playing like that. He plays perfectly for what was needed on every album. For that time, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you know, yes, he was a relatively simple drummer, He's got a great groove, and I couldn't picture anybody else doing that, you know, uh, on those records. Or McCartney's bass notes. A everything. Which are odd. They're perfect for each other. Right, right. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, okay. So the, the, it's so inspiring to me to listen to. I'd have to pick a Frank Sinatra record. It always changes, you know, maybe only the lonely. lonely. Yeah. yeah. You know, because I love those torch songs, those, those, as I call them, the wrist slashers, you know. Yeah. I do. I love that stuff. Um, I'd have to pick from the classical world either the original recordings of Pablo Casals doing those those Bach pieces, uh, the cello suites, the cello suites, yeah, because it's they're so beautifully played and and it's Bach and it's it does sound like a person improvising. You can hear the connection there, and uh, or maybe just because I loved his sound so much, Robert Marcellus's Mozart clarinet concerto, which is his only solo recording, yes, yes. strangely enough. You know? Yeah, oh, well, that, that was issued uh, in any, to any large degree, and it's still sort of the Bible for American clarinet players, yeah. and, and, and well, it's, but, as well it should. But man, that sound, you know. And then I love um, the, sun, the dizzy, sunny, stit, sunny Rollins album with the Eternal Triangle like, on yeah. it. Yeah. That is just... You can't get any better than that. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. That's well, it. That, those are some great choices, yeah. uh, and and some different ones. Though I hope, hopefully, the listeners, and especially the young listeners, uh, these are, you know, jewels to go out and check out and purchase, uh, and not just buy, not just stream one uh, track or yes. two tracks of the whole yeah. deal. Well, that's the thing again about, for example, getting back to the Beatles. They spend a lot of time sequencing an album. It's a story. You're supposed to listen from beginning to end. Right. I'm not putting myself even in the same planet as them, but 
I've inspired by people like that and Sinatra. I, th I think about that on my albums even now, hoping that there's somebody out there who's actually going to listen from the first song to the last. Right. This is supposed to be a flow. Right. You know, and, and we do think about that. You right. Know? And let's just talk about your uh, new album coming out next month uh, with guitar and yeah. clarinet, a, a, a departure for you. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about well, the album. There's a guy, a great guitarist named Diego Figueredo. And I've been working a lot with him. And we love playing as a duo because he's this wild Brazilian guy who, who you know, loves to do the, cl the classic repertoire of the Jobim stuff, but his own way. And then we'll even play some free jazz stuff and just free improvisations and go off in all these little directions. And it's really fun. And so we did a duo record called Amazade, which means friendship. And that's coming out, and and the, the record before that was a big band record, right? Because um, over the years I've guested with a lot of bands and had charts written for me, and so I had enough for for a big band album, and I'm really proud of that one. It's called uh, Sunrise. And, and the, you've had some of the greatest arrangers, yeah. uh, on that. I mean, tell us about some of the arrangers you featured on that well, album. Well, Dennis McCrell, great drummer and arranger. Yes, uh, he wrote some beautiful arrangements for me. A, Another drummer named Alan Ganley, who uh, was a uh, British drummer who, who wrote a lot of things for the BBC. And uh, uh, I play instrumental versions with a little bit of re-editing of these great uh, lesser known Billy May arrangements right. that he wrote for the Sinatra Ellington album. Right. Because they make great instrumentals. And I think it's some of Billy May's greatest writing. Absolutely. Uh, and for many years, people thought it was Ellington's arrangements because Billy wasn't credited on the album. Yeah. But it's really great creative writing. So I did a couple of those. Mark Lopin, who's turned into one of the great arrangers in New York. He's yes. written a lot of things for me over the years. So yeah, those are some a, of my... The potpourri of wonderful arrangers yeah. and, and different and, styles. And I found, uh, actually, somebody presented me years ago with the only copy, because it's in his own pencil handwriting of Alec Wilder, wrote an arrangement right. for Benny Goodman and a, an original composition called Clarinet in Springtime. Right. This is the premier recording and it's not even listed in, in the Wilder books. Huh. It's, he wrote it for Benny. It was, perform, it was performed at a rehearsal and it's a through composed piece and right. a difficult piece and I think Benny just wasn't in the mood for it. Yeah. Shoved it aside. Yeah, a little bit, it's sort of a little bit akin to, not exactly, but the Eddie Sauter. Yeah, uh, kind of like of, that. The yeah. arrangements and, and the colors are different and there's more advanced harmonic language maybe yeah. that Benny felt comfortable yeah. with. And, and I guess Alec Wilder was not happy and wanted to just leave everything in the rehearsal studio. And his friend, a guy named Jim Marr, uh, said, do you mind if I keep the score? And he said, I don't give, give it. Whatever you want to do with it, you know. <laughs> so, and then all these years later, he gave me the, the score, and I had the parts copied. And so Beautiful. That's, yeah. it's nice and to be able it, and to it's a great that. big band album, and we're Thank definitely you. going to feature Thanks. one of the cuts uh, on that album on the uh, outtake. Um, just to wrap this up, um, I just wanted to uh, throw something at you, something I started in my last interview called Firing Line, where I... Uh, name, you know, a number of, of clarinet players in this case, and just mm. give us a, a, as quick a synopsis as you can of your impressions of these clarinetists. Okay, okay so I'll just throw them out. Should Mar I just say can't play after every one of them? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately, none of these are going to fall into that category. Okay, okay so Barney Brigard. Oh, uh, unique, completely unique, uh, un, un, un uh, imitatable player. And that's, that's to his great testament. I never heard anybody like that. It's phenomenal play. Okay. Pee Wee Russell. You could say the same thing about him. People like to dismiss him as this primitive clarinet player. Again, you try to do that. Pure emotion. Uh, his earlier records, he, had, he, he exhibited a great sense of time. Actually, more technique than he's given credit for. So I love Pee Wee. Um, Kenny Deverne comes out of the Pee Wee Russell School by his own admission. Pee Wee was a big influence on him. But DeVern was a mentor of mine. We were close friends. And DeVern, I know this isn't as brief as you probably wanted. But, That's okay. But DeVern uh, got lumped in with you know the trad jazz players. I think to, to 
it was unfortunate for him because he was such a great clarinetist. Beautiful. You know this. And, and one of the most beautiful sounds. He has the most, and he thought a lot about the mechanics of the instrument. Huh. And knew a lot about the mechanics of played, the instrument. Played a kind of unique setup. Uh, yeah. yeah. And he changed, he, for one a time he played a hard rubber clarinet. Huh. Uh, Interesting. But he, he was the only other person besides Artie Shaw that had such an impressive extra octave above all the rest of us. He really did, and he was so comfortable up there, and he worked out his own fingerings. Right. And, and I know he was a very studious player. I know he actually studied and took lessons with David Weber. That's there. right. He, he was very proud of his relationship with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Uh, Artie Shaw. Artie Shaw. Uh, phenomenal clarinetist, uh, staggering technique, mastery of the instrument. Just don't, don't write letters, people. Don't hate me. Not my favorite. Personally, I always like Benny as a, the hotter of the two, the hotter jazz player. Uh, I'm impressed by Artie Shaw, not necessarily always moved by him. That's just my thing. So Okay, that's, yeah. that's fine. Uh, Buddy DeFranco. Uh, well, because I, also I knew Buddy. He was such a great, sweet, sweet man, so supportive. I loved him. Buddy was the, the guy who moved the clarinet forward. Let's face it. He's the person. You know, took it into the bebop era and beyond. Uh, and everybody post-Buddy can thank him for that, you know. Yep. Uh, Eddie Daniels. Eddie Daniels was the, is the Mike Brecker of the clarinet, you know, really. Honestly, Eddie, quantum leap forward as far as technique, staggering technique. and But comes out of Buddy's approach. Buster Bailey. Wow, that's a... Uh, I have a lot of Buster Bailey. I have this, all those great things with uh, Charlie Shavers and the, uh, yeah. um, you know, the small group, the famous small group with Russell Proko, Charlie Shavers, the yeah. ba John Kirby. S set that, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe not the greatest improviser, but a, but a great technical player on the clarinet. Uh, and could really swing. Really could swing. And had, there's a couple records of him. There's uh, those, some of those, those John Kirby things. Just really, really impressive clarinet playing. Yes, and and there are so many of them, by the way, available on the um, the website of thirties.com, thirtiesjazz.com. There's a lot of Buster oh, I Bailey didn't know about this. and, Jer and the John Kirby six. Also, six, another six, guy to, to people forget about is Jimmy Noon, who Deverne talks about a lot too. And it was a huge influence on Benny. Yeah, yeah, and again, you. You know, you forget, you think every all of those guys did had limited technique. No, Jimmy Noon had staggering technique. Great, uh, different sense of articulating, too. He would play a lot of stuff that you can find in all these etude books that I keep talking about, where he, he'd play like um, a phrase uh, uh, based around an arpeggio with only one note changing, and he'd tongue the notes instead of slurring them, and... Uh, Real different approach. Interesting. And, and to wrap it up, Benny. To me, Benny was the greatest. Just because uh, from his first records, just out of the box, great. You know? Like almost fully formed from his, his earliest recordings. Um, res responsible for a lot of the great... 20th century classical works. Absolutely. The definitive version of the Bartok Contrast. Nobody could play that better than him. Uh, you came close. You did a great recording <laughs> Thanks. of that. Thanks. But, but, I, but you listen to Benny and it's, it's staggeringly you know, beautiful. You know, and the truth is that uh, <coughs> uh, Contrast's composition that Benny commissioned yeah. and helped, really helped save Bartok at a time that he was very destitute and not doing well physically. Mm. B it's hard to know if Bartok's career would have ascended to the levels it has and some of the great orchestral works that uh, were ultimately commissioned by Kosovitsky for Boston, yeah. that Benny's uh, impetus at that time and, and going along with Joseph Sivgetti to, right. to get this... That gave him a certain cachet. Cachet. And cash. And, yeah, and <laughs> that, but it really propelled his That's career. That's true, yeah. And so Benny, with so many, it was a hero in so many yeah. levels. And look, to me, there's nobody greater as, as an improviser, as a hotter player. Sometimes I tell the audience about this too, when there's very few instrumentalists 
that made such a mark on songs that we think of them as their songs. Like, you know, you, th you listen to um, uh, The Lady is a Tramp and you go, oh, that's a Sinatra song, even though he didn't write it. Right. You can't say that about a lot of instrumentalists. Pops being the other one, probably. Exactly. Or, yeah. or Coleman Hawkins, right. Body, Body and Soul. Soul. Yeah. But Benny, Memories of You, Avalon, Poor Butterfly. After You've Gone. After You've Gone. It goes on and on. Yeah. Those are Benny Goodman songs. Yeah. That's how strong he was yeah. and always will yeah. be. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's... And even as a frail old man, when I played with him, he could still lift a band with his playing, with that great sense of time. Incidentally, everybody loves to tell the mean, eccentric Benny stories. He tried to get me a record deal before I signed with Concord. He, wow. he heard my demo tape and offered to produce a record of mine with the label that he was on at the time, with, which was this label, Music Masters. And uh, they, they said no, and then I signed with Concord. But just knowing that, he had a generous side to him. He was just a very complicated guy. But uh, yeah. you, know, well, you talk about the Bartok thing, too. Sure. Yeah. Well, one of the great, I think, um, bios of a musician is the, I think it's Ross Firestone book on Benny called Swing, Swing, yeah. Swing. And you realize the childhood that Benny Goodman had and what he, way he grew up, not many people could have come out of that sane. Right. If anybody could have. Yeah. Uh, uh, but so it, may, it gives you just a little other side to Benny and what he dealt with yeah. growing up. Uh, it was quite, uh, it was torturous. Yeah. But fortunately, we, you know, he came out and he propelled the clarinet in jazz and in classical music. That's right. And so we have someone like Ken Poplowski today carrying on that tradition. Oh, thank you. Thanks, great Ken. talking to you. It was great. It was really, fun. really fun. Thank you, man. And really. thank you for listening. And we hope you'll uh, continue to listen to the videos on the Woodwind Legacy series and come back for more. Thank you. If I just pick up the horn, uh, I just try to do a little warm up like... Um, and I'm just listening to see if my sound has a uniformity from the bottom to the top of the instrument and that I'm uh, not tightening up in the embouchure and, and I'm just pushing the air through. Uh, and I try to apply that and remember that as I'm playing. Uh, also, if I'm playing fast passages, let's say I'm playing I Got Rhythm Changes, I remind myself to have what I call economy of movement, which means taking a page from classical musicians. Uh, I'm just going to pivot as much as possible and not move too much here. I use the wrists, you know, I use, I use knuckles, everything's coming in around the instrument. I apply that to saxophone too. Cause let it just, just, um, it makes sense. If you're having to shift all the time or do this, that's takes that's going to take you more time to get back to where you're supposed to be. So the least amount of extraneous movement you get, you can get away with, the faster you can play it, the more comfortable it will be. In the moment, sometimes you forget, but I'm always trying to remind myself. So. Uh, talking about Jimmy Noon, here's the kind of thing Jimmy would play uh, on, let's say, um, he had a concert F chord, he would play... Uh, and all that stuff comes out of the classical etude books. And Jimmy would just, you know, beef it up a little by... Uh, and then there's Benny's, you know, typical licks like, um, and it's just changing the one note. And again, you find all this 
in all those books, there's, there's all kinds of exercises like this. And I don't know that they didn't get that from studying some of those kinds of, uh, of works for the clarinet. Thank you.